All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego and today I'm joined by Paul Smith who is in the Cincinnati, Ohio area. How are you doing, Paul? Yeah, very good, John. Uh, not quite as beautiful here as it is there though. Yeah, well, you know, not everywhere can be San Diego, but exactly. then it would be, be a boring world if everywhere is <laughs> the same. And so Paul is one of the world's leading experts on organizational storytelling and Inc. Magazine top 100 leadership speaker, storytelling coach, Amazon of three, or author of three Amazon bestsellers, including the book Sell with the Story. It's where we want to focus on today, how to capture attention, build trust and close the sales, sell with a story. Um, so, Paul, one of the things that always strikes me about selling and storytelling is that uh, a lot of salespeople and people in general are natural storytellers, but sometimes when they get into a business situation, they kind of forget that and they go into kind of what they expect more like pitchy or more kind of corporate speak and they mm -hmm. forget to leverage the power of storytelling. Why is it just, why do you think that is that people sometimes abandon the natural ability to tell stories and go into a completely different mode? Yes, I, that's a good observation. Now, I don't think it's just salespeople that do that. Mm -hmm. I think most of us do that, whether we're in sales or not. In fact, I think it's just part of being an adult that um, you know, we forget. In fact, ask any kid, you know, six, seven, eight year old kid to tell you a story and they'll know just how to do it. I mean, they'll, just, they'll start telling a story and they're completely comfortable doing it. But you ask an adult that and they just, they freeze up. So there, there, something happens between childhood and adulthood that we just, we forget that we actually can tell stories and it's okay and people actually wanna hear them. Um, and we go into more business professional speak. It's again, not just in sales. Um, so I think it's a natural thing that we need to unlearn. Uh, mm -hmm. We need to unlearn that behavior. And it's interesting because uh, uh, most cultures have like very, very strong oral storytelling traditions. I, don't, I mean, I'm, I'm originally from Ireland and Ireland has a very rich storytelling, you know, history mm -hmm. and culture where storytellers throughout, the, throughout history were very celebrated in communities and travel from place to place to tell stories. Uh, and, and so, it's in there in most of us, it's inbuilt in most of us, and it's in, our, it's in our cultural DNA. But as you say, we tend not to leverage it as much. So, so let's talk about when, when you are using storytelling in sales in particular, you know, what does a sales story look like? Yeah, so, well, first of all, there's a lot of different kinds of sales stories. Um, in mm -hmm. fact, that's one of the main purposes of the book is to lay out 25 different types of sales stories. Um, you know, so when people call and tell me, Hey, we need you to help us with our sales story. My first question is, well, which one, <laughs> you know, right. and we get into it and we realize, Oh, there's really seven or eight that you really need right now. Or there's three that you need, or there's 10 that you need. You never need all 25, mm -hmm. but, you know, th that's kind of the set to choose from. So, you know, uh, that's the first challenge in sales is figure out what stories do you need to tell? So at some point in the conversation, you know, over the six month sales cycle, where you might have seven or eight or nine different touch points with the prospect. At some point, you might be telling your company's founding story. At some point, you might be telling a problem story, a, a, a story to illustrate the problem that your product or service solves. At some point, you're surely going to be telling a success story, a customer success right. story, right? You helped somebody and here's how. Um, you might be telling a story uh, that, that answers the question, how are we different than our competitors? So I call that a marketing story, but it's told in the sales mm -hmm. sure. context. You know, you might be telling a, a, an urgency, a sense of urgency story, which is a, a story once you've already done all the selling and they are ready to buy, but just not now, come back later. Like you've done everything right. Um, you know, a story to create a sense of urgency so they want to buy now instead of later. You know, after the sale, you might be telling a story, a loyalty building story to get them to, okay, I've already, I was successful selling you this time but I want you to come back again and again and again. And so I want to keep telling you stories to keep you happy and interested in buying from me again. So I just rattled off five or six right there. You know, and they all follow the same storytelling techniques in that there's, you know, a, a hero and a villain, there's a time and a place, mm -hmm. there's, uh, you know, a challenge being faced and, you know, but, but the content of the story is different each time. And the lesson you learn is different because it's serving a different purpose. And it's interesting because what you outlined there is you know, the story structure as well. And the fact is that 
we don't have to learn story structure. When we're being told a story, we almost innately know how it's going to flow. So there's, as you tell your story, the receiver, there's an expectation of where this is going to go. You're going to set it up. You know, there's going to be a, there's going to be that part in the middle and then everything's going to get resolved in the end. And it's a very comfortable place for us on the receiving end. It, it is. And, and what that means is it becomes very uncomfortable when somebody does not follow that pattern. Mm -hmm. And so I do end up teaching people the pattern, uh, which is loosely as you just described it, but I make it easier for them. I give them eight questions your story needs to answer. And if you answer them in this order, that's the pattern the human brain is looking for. And when you violate that pattern, uh, bad things happen. They, they stop listening, they get confused. And so mm -hmm. you need to follow this pattern uh, where you're probably in trouble. And if you're interested, I can, I can give you the eight questions. Yeah, sure. Let's do it. Yeah. So here they are. So first question is, why should I bother listening to your story? You need to give them a good reason to listen mm -hmm. to you for the next two or three minutes or, or they won't. Right. But once you've answered that question, then you've kind of earned the right to answer the next five questions. Where and when did it take place? Who's the main character and what did they want? What was the problem or opportunity they ran into? What did they do about it? And how did it turn out in the end? And that should sound like the natural flow of a story because mm -hmm. it is, as you pointed out, the yeah. natural flow of a story. But there's two questions left, right? So number seven and eight, which is, what lesson did you learn and yeah. what should I go do now? So that's your opportunity to make a recommendation. So those two happen after the story, but they're still part of the storytelling. Yeah, no, and I think that's incredibly important, as you said, like to outline that there is a structure to it and there's something we're expecting. If you want to break that structure, great for art house movies or whatever, not so much for when you're in a sales situation. And, and here's an interesting thing. You have a chapter in your book about getting the buyers to tell their story. So it's great for us to tell our story and it's interesting and it can have a great impact on the person who's listening. But when we provoke, if you like, or prompt the other person to tell their story, that's, almost, that's even more powerful in many ways. Yeah, and for some of the same reasons, it, it, it benefits you to tell your stories because it's more, uh, it helps them understand what you're, what you're communicating better. And the same in reverse, you'll understand their problems better, their needs better, if you get them to tell you stories, not just tell you give you answers or short answers. Mm -hmm. So for example, if, um, if you ask somebody, you know, so what's your biggest problem right now? This is a prospect you're, you're talking to because you want to solve their problem. What's your biggest problem? And they tell you, oh, warehousing. Warehousing is our biggest problem. Mm -hmm. Well, you really don't know much. But yeah. if instead, if you ask the question this way, when, tell me about the moment you realized your biggest problem was your biggest problem. Yeah. Well, now they have to tell you a story about something that happened. Oh, it was when the fire broke out in the warehouse or, or oh, there was that time we got that huge order from a, our biggest customer and we didn't have any of the product on hand. So we had to run a special production run. It cost a bunch of money. We shipped it, you know, super expedited, you know, cost and got there just in time. And then we went out to the warehouse and found what they were looking for right where it should have been all along. Oh, now you, now you know what a warehousing problem is. It's an inventory location management problem problem, right? So you want them to tell you real stories so that you'll know which of your stories to tell and you'll understand the situation better. And, and it, yeah. takes, it takes eliciting stories from them, not just asking simple questions. Yeah. And the good thing is that if you tell a story, generally speaking, one of the reactions that it has in the other person is they want to they want to match that story or they want to find something similar to it because they want to, they say, well, that was really interesting. Now I want to be interesting. Yes. Yes. And in fact, that's one of the techniques in that chapter for how to get them to tell you stories. If the other techniques like that, that, uh, that story elicitation mm -hmm. technique of, of asking the uh, question about, tell me about a time when something happened. One of the techniques, if that doesn't work, is you tell a story like the one that you want them to tell you so that it will do exactly that. They'll go, oh yeah, something like that happened to me once. <laughs> Let me tell you about it. And it's inter And the other part that's interesting is, okay, so the people that you're telling stories to in a sales context, they're not always the same. It's not a monolithic type of person, right? It's, it's, they're different types of people. So you have the person who may be a big, dramatic, embellished story, you know, delivered will work really well for them because that's what they like. But then you may have a very analytical person. So you need to maybe, as you say, you might need to tell a story using data or something like that. Now that's a skill in itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta continue to read your audience to know exactly which of these stories to tell. Cause it's not like you're gonna tell all 25 of these stories mm -hmm. and you're not gonna tell them in the same order 
Um, you need, and some of them you need to plan to tell, like, oh, I've got a sales call. I'm going to tell the founding story. I'm going to tell the problem story. And I'm going to tell a how we're different from our competitor story over the course of that 30 minutes. And that's, you know, two or three minutes each. So it's mm -hmm. like seven or eight minutes. I'm going to tell stories and the rest of the 23 minutes or whatever. I'm, I'm just going to be talking and going through my sales pitch and all that. So some of your stories definitely should be planned because they should be, they should be part of your sales pitch, not the whole sales pitch, but they should be part of it. But some of your stories should be delivered ad hoc when the time is right. Like when, yeah. when an objection comes up, some of the stories are objection resolving stories that you would only tell if this objection comes up. Okay. I'm going to tell you a story to get you to not, to resolve that objection for you, but you need to have it in your head ready. Yeah. So how you, when you're faced with, as I say, when you're faced with somebody who's highly analytical and you need to use a lot of data and stuff, how do you tell a story that is still interesting but meets the needs of that data-driven person? And maybe, and maybe if you're selling to more than one person, maybe there's other people in the room or on the call, on the Zoom call or whatever, so you don't want to lose them either. Yeah, yeah, good question. So a, a couple of things come to mind. First of all, you shouldn't be telling stories the whole time. Right? Mm -hmm. In fact, 10 to 15% of the time, I think you should be telling stories. But that means that, you know, uh, 85 to 90% of the time, you're not telling stories. So it shouldn't be that you're just constantly telling stories and the people sure. that aren't interested in that are drifting off. I mean, it should, the, storytelling shouldn't be the most frequent technique you use, but it probably will be the most powerful. Um, but for those, and so for those more data-driven people, the 85 to 90% of the things coming out of your mouth are right exactly what they're, they're after. But you can also tell stories with data. And that's, I, I don't just mean, uh, what do they call it these days? Um, data visualization, like fancier charts and graphs or better looking, you know, chart. That's not what I'm talking about. That's important too. But yeah. I mean, you can actually, there are some techniques to tell stories with data, just like you can with words. And it has some of the similar techniques of um, uh, there's, a, there's a beginning, a middle and an end. There's some emotional connection. There's usually a surprise ending. You're letting the audience draw the conclusion instead of you tell them the conclusion, but you can do it with numbers also. So that might appeal to them more than a more narrative storytelling technique. Mm -hmm. And the other thing about, uh, about telling stories. So, uh, I mean, a lot of people are binging on Netflix and that and things like that right now. And you will, obviously you'll see a lot of things based on a true story, but some events have been changed to, you know, fit the, fit the drama, or whatever. So that's the same in many ways when you're, when you're telling stories is some of your stories are, are going to need to be uh, adapted a little bit without telling, obviously without them being false and just being fiction, but you will need to adapt them and massage them a little bit to be relevant. Yeah, so one of the techniques there is you can tell stories from a different person's perspective. So in a, in a typical story, you might have three characters, say the main character, the kind of the villain, you know, and then, you know, somebody else that's involved in the story. So if you're, if you're talking to, um, I don't know, a group of mostly men, you might tell the story from the perspective of the, one of the men in the stories. But if you're talking to a group of women, you might tell the, sto the story from the perspective of one of the women in the stories, or, you know, or if it's a CEO versus a CFO versus a HR person, you might pick mm -hmm. a different person in the story to tell the story from their perspective. That's one way to, to change it. But if you're talking about like embellishment in general of stories, I mean, you can, you can still do that, but I, I caution people to, you know, don't do it too much. Don't, don't embellish stories any more than you're willing to embellish facts. So right. like everybody's willing to round off numbers, you know, 14.7% mm -hmm. sure. becomes 15% and that's fine. Nobody cares, right? You're just making it easier for the audience to understand. Um, and that's, I think it's the same with stories. You know, you can, you can change people's names to keep it, you know, if, to, to protect the anonymity of the people in the story. You might change the, the date or something to make it more, you know, newer or something. But yeah, if you're changing the main tenets of the story of what happened and the, the outcome of the story and the mm -hmm. lesson in the story, well, now you're kind of just making stuff up, which, <laughs> yeah. which, which would be okay as long as your audience knows you've made it up, right? So mm -hmm. if you start out a story, yeah, there's this, uh, there's a legend at our company, you know, from way back when, and yeah. then you tell some story. Well, everybody knows it's kind of made up, but if you tell a story and people are assuming it's a true story, it, it should be you know, pretty close to the, uh, the truth of what happened. I, I think. Mm -hmm. No, no, I, I agree with you. I'm just saying, obviously sometimes the story stories may not be as interesting. Uh, if you just deliver them, you know, the chronologically or whatever, sometimes you need to, 
you need to package it a little bit better while while keeping obviously the the facts mm. in in place. Yeah. Um. And how much uh, how much do do should salespeople really practice their storytelling skills? Because again, as I said, I think it's innate in a lot of people, but it's maybe a dormant or forgotten skill set. Mm. Uh, and so, how, do you encourage people to really practice their storytelling, become like far better storytellers? Uh, well, I, I do, but typically not for my sales audiences. And here's why. If I'm talking to somebody who they want to be a better storyteller because they've got a big speech coming up or they're going to go do mm-hmm. a TEDx talk. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you should practice. But salespeople are telling stories every day. Every sales call is practice for the next sales call. So mm-hmm. they really don't need to go practice a lot, you know, unless they're in a really strange line of work that they only make five sales calls a year. Right. Most salespeople are making five a day. So every they, they get an opportunity to practice frequently anyway, so they don't have to practice separately. Um, but they do need to do it, uh, right? So it's not like, uh, I'm going to tell a story in this sales call, and then I'm not going to again for a month. And I'm going to go all those sales calls in the middle and not tell a story. You need to go ahead and start doing it. But most salespeople will get enough practice just because they make a lot of sales calls. And how can they then assess whether they're doing it well or not? Yeah. <laughs> the same way they assess whether they're, they're making their sales pitch right. Mm-hmm. Did it work? Did, did, did it work? Did they close the sale. It's the same criteria. Yeah. I mean, and you know, that, that's only a little bit tongue in cheek, but I mean, uh, you get the same kind of cues you do when you're making a speech on stage. And, you know, if your audience mm-hmm. is yawning and looking at their watch or looking at their phone, you're, you're clearly not yeah. very interesting. Something, something's not working with that story, mm-hmm. you know, or if they get a confused look on their face, that's a clue that you didn't answer one of the eight questions in the right order. You, you know, you mm-hmm. forgot to answer it and they're, they're kind of confused about that. Um, so th- those kind of, I think, obvious clues will, will hit you in the face if you're not doing well. Yeah. And also probably to look at things like, uh, you know, pacing and, and all of that kind of thing as well, because I mean, I know I've seen people who are, who are very good um, salespeople, but if they get into storytelling, sometimes you have to kind of cut them off because they get, they start to go too far. So I think, yeah, yeah. So you got to pay attention to, to pacing and the length of your stories. Yeah. So, so the best stories are about two minutes long in, mm-hmm. in sales I've found. Um, the leadership stories that some of my leadership audiences are three or four minutes long, but you've got more of a captive audience in that yeah. case. Um, yeah, two, you shouldn't be talking for more than two minutes in, in a story. Um, and keeping, keeping to the eight questions will help you do that. So if that's what you mean by pacing, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah they, they and, and long stories. And getting rid of extraneous uh, content too, because there's nothing right. more, there's nothing more frustrating than if you're listening to a story and the person then is telling you like the color of the door and you're going, I don't care about the color of the door. I care what's behind the door. Open the door. For God's yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was a, it was a warm September morning. Yeah. yeah great. The leaves <laughs> were, <laughs> yeah. that, that's great if you're reading a novel, but you don't, you yeah. don't need that in a, in a sales call. Yeah. And that's why I like you say, if you're, you have your eight questions or whatever, so you can look and you can say, okay, does my story hit that? And, and if it hits other stuff that's not contained in those eight questions, then you exactly. probably want to leave those out. Exactly. Perfect. Um, great. Uh, Paul, this has been fascinating. So the book is called uh, Sell with the Story, How to Capture Attention, Build Trust and Close the Sale. All of Paul's information, including a link to the book, will be below this video. Uh, but before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Yeah, well, th- thanks. Uh, and they, they can probably find me directly the easiest on my website, which is uh, leadwithastory.com. But when I'm not researching and writing about the art and science of storytelling, I'm, I'm with clients teaching them. So it's usually a team of a team of salespeople or a, a leader, a multifunctional leadership team. And we'll spend a whole day and we'll go through all of the, the basics of what stories you need, do some brainstorming exercises, then we'll I'll have them tell some stories and we'll work on those stories and make them better by the end of the day. So they really get their hands on, you know, workshop kind of thing and taking stories and making them better throughout the day. So they not only learn how to do it in the future, but they leave with, you know, a handful of really good sales stories to start their, start their week with. Yeah, absolutely. And I would encourage people to check out the book, Sell with a Story. Like I said, I mean, stories resonate with us. They're in, they're in our cultural DNA generally like storytelling as, as a, uh, as a historical way of delivering information. And I think that it really will serve people to, to pay attention, especially now, because I think people 
we've gone through a strange period and I think people crave a lot more humanization in their interactions and stories are a great way of bringing that out. I agree. Yeah, good point. All right. Well, thank you for listening. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. See you all for another interview really soon. Thank you. Yeah.